Since I'm keeping in touch with the Halloween spirit, I figure I should check in on Scooby-Doo and the rest of the Mystery Ink gang. That talking dog with a slight speech impediment has been entertaining both children and adults for years, mostly introducing us to ways we can sharpen our deducing skills. Or at least for me, it was the character that never talked a lot, but had just enough screen time to make somewhat of an impression. A couple of years ago, I reviewed Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island, which had an interesting twist where the monsters were real, adding better animation along with a well-written story which went as far as giving more personality to their already established characters. So it came to no surprise that with its success, what followed was a slew of similar stories with the Mystery Gang. Or in other words, studio execs at Warner Brothers knew that this was a decades-old cash cow that still had a lot of milk to share. This brings us to the film distributed and produced right after Zombie Island, Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost. A movie opens to another typical Scooby-Doo caper. However, instead of the traditional theme song from the original series, guess who does the cover? Scooby-Dooby-Doo, where are you? We got some work to do now. That's right, it's Billy Ray Cyrus, making one bad decision after another. And no, I avoid using modern Miley Cyrus as the butt of this joke because, uh... I got some semblance of class. The gang has helped solving the mystery by a horror writer named Ben Ravencroft. He's voiced by Tim Curry, which should sound like a big deal, but growing up in the late 90s and early 2000s, it was pretty commonplace to see him voice cartoon characters. Which is pretty unusual about his performance is the way he tries to hide his British accent. Listen, Velma, I'm going back to my hometown in Massachusetts this weekend, to the house where I wrote my early books. I go back every year for the fall color. It's about as good as Eric Idle hiding his accent in that other Rudolph movie I reviewed some time ago. And don't worry if you make the connection between Ben Ravencroft and Stephen King. He's a writer whose focus is horror and lives in a New England town. Ravencroft invites the gang to his home. As we discover that the town has a legend involving a witch who just so happens to be the blood relative to Ravencroft. Now hold on, this sounds just like the plot to Paranorman. And to think I thought that was the most original film of 2012. Ravencroft is disappointed with the whole affair, as he claims that she's not a witch, but a Wiccan. Truth be told, this is more or less a stereotype that happens in real life. However, Ben also had a fixation on finding her lost journal, leading the audience to believe it would clear her past up. But we'll get to that later. To further remind ourselves of this dilemma, we have a group of horror-themed musicians who take up a quarter of the film's running time singing songs. I'm not exaggerating this. They spend a good time in the film singing. So Sham, Jet, and the Fake Hot put an act revolving around witches, where the band's lead singer is... part Wiccan. <laughs> yeah, right. Sally McKnight, 116th blood on my mother's side. Now, wait a minute. How do you have a blood relation to being Wiccan? It's not like a race of ethnicity, but a general philosophy with traditions. So whether or not you had a mother who was Wicca doesn't determine that you are a Wiccan. Pfft, whatever. So we get the traditional Scooby shenanigans, Scooby and Shaggy have an appetite, come across a witch that scares them, Velma constructs a plan to stop the foe, and lo and behold, it was all a man in the mask. Actually, it was more or less the whole town in the act, so they can further exploit the town's past. And that was Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost. To be honest with you, I was expecting just a little bit more- Wait a minute, what's going on? The movie's not over yet? Well, okay then. We eventually discover what Ravencroft's book was not a journal, but a spell book. Which means we get a bait and switch from a fake witch to a full out monstrosity as played by voice actress royalty Trace McNeil. However, before releasing her, we see Tim Curry finally do what he does best. Oct in an over the top fashion. <laughs> this isn't one of your silly little mysteries. You can't solve me so easily. <laughs> Finally, after waiting over a half an hour watching Curry bumble around and play a subdued role, it's relieving to see him go full Curry. However, it's cut short when the witch's ghost traps him, then decides to ravage the town with her dark magic. So seeing how Zombie Island took risk by having face-melting voodoo magic and kill a cat people, what do they have in store for us now? Well, there's creepy pumpkins that fall apart easily, and a giant turkey that makes a turnaround by the end. Mmm, pretty weak. Now if McNeil could interject some bloodbending into the mix, that would make it worthwhile. So get this, in order to stop the witch, there needs to be another witch to read from the book. A good witch, per se. 
Because Thorn, the lead singer, mentions having Wiccan descent, it allows her full access to stop a hundred years old curse. Again, kind of a stretch considering how she was not really a witch per se. But again, being a Wiccan is part of a faith or religion. Because she doesn't practice it devoutly other than a natural herb she puts together, it only makes it a little confusing. Like, imagine if you were a white Protestant asked to stop the ghost of Attila the Hun because your great great uncle's aunt's brother was a Mongol. I mean, what sense does that make? Just imagine if Johnny Depp, a predominantly white actor, claimed that his distant Cherokee heritage made him the perfect cast for Tut. I'm gonna shut up right now. Anyways, it ends up working. The witch is trapped, along with Curry in the spellbook. They would have gotten away with it if it weren't for the meddling kids, Ruby Dooby Doo, and cut to another song. Well that was Scooby Doo and the Witch's Ghost. Was it as good as Zombie Island? Short answer, not really. Long answer, here's why. When Scooby Doo and Zombie Island came out, it introduced us to a new form that was both fresh, inventive, and willing to take risks while staying true to the original. Sure, there was the gang reuniting out of boredom which didn't make a whole lot of sense, but with the well thought zombie curse mixed with voodoo mysticism, this made the film an entertaining watch. With Witch's Ghost, they still had the good animation, an interesting bait and switch ending, and fun performances specifically from Tim Curry as the villain. However, with the lack of character we had from the previous film, it seems to suffer from the lack of quality that happens when Scooby Doo cartoons get beaten like a dead horse. Or should I say, a talking Great Dane. To put it in comparison to Zombie Island, we had an hour and a half running time. Witch's Ghost barely fits in the hour. It was almost as if it was produced on the offshoot that Zombie Island would turn out better than expected. Which is to say it still had a funny line or two poking at the cliches from the old cartoon, just not reflective of the freshness Zombie Island had which made the witch's ghost seem more like witch's old hat. Hence why the film comes out to a tolerable okay rating, where it's enough to keep the kids and fans happy, but nothing to hold your breath to. Uh, yeah, it's okay, I mean it's not as good as Scooby Doo on Zombie Island, but you know, whatever. Now for the question for the day, who is your favorite fictional witch? If it had to be me, I gotta go with the Wicked Witch of the West. Specifically the original musical, I mean, she was the epitome of nasty witches. I can't include her from Wicked since I still haven't seen the play, and most definitely not the awkward excuse from Sam Raimi, Oz the Great and Powerful. Though it does make you wonder why Sam Raimi can't get green-skinned characters right. Is he a green skinophobe or something? I'm Joey Tedesco, and all this talk of witchcraft makes me want to go watch Paranorman again. Oh boy, this is so exciting. I haven't seen this film in a year. Oh, wait a minute. This isn't Paranorman. This is some other film that's kind of like it, but it's creepier and got worse jokes. I wish I had a name for this film. It just slips my mind. What was it called? It's... Uh... It's... It's... It's...